I just want to thank Bill for the invitation to speak today and the rest of the ARIA task force and our staff at the ASG for really being instrumental in everything that we do. So thank you. And especially also to you for attending here. I think uh, it's awesome to see so many faces in our, in our group, and I hope to meet all of you. And it really shows dedication on your part, not only to patient care, but engagement with physicians in the process. And so we're excited that you're here. I'm excited that I'm here. So I think um, we can all move forward and learn together. So um, this talk is going to be about the small and large intestine. And so this is on the side of the digestive tract that we're moving through. And I'll incorporate some uh, about the digestive organs, but primarily focus on the digestive tract here. And so just to start, the small intestine is about 20 to 25 feet in length. And so it loops back and forth in everybody's abdomen. No matter if you're a large frame or a small frame, you still have the same distance in there. And the reason is because, as you can see there, it's compact and folded on each other in the uh, abdomen. Um, the stomach empties its contents then through the pylorus, and then it enters into the small intestine. And so its major functions are where digestion of food really occurs. So when people say, hey, my digestion is off, it's in my stomach, actually most of the digestion happens in that small intestine. And it's really instrumental in the absorption of nutrients. So when we think about disease processes that have to do with malnutrition or um, absence of some micronutrients, we should start to think it's probably related to the small bowel. And so it's composed of three major segments, as you can see. The first part is the duodenum, the next part is the jejunum, and then the last part, right before it enters into the large bowel, which is also known as the colon, is the ileum. And so I'll break each one of those down by parts right now. And so the duodenum, so we can see the pylorus empties out from the stomach, and the duodenum is composed of four segments. And during endoscopy, if you're with us or you see us, we'll comment on some of these parts and how far we can go with our endoscopes. And so that first part is the duodenal bulb. And then coming around what's called the duodenal sweep, you'll get to the second portion of the duodenum, which is the typical location of the papilla, otherwise known. You might hear people talk about the ampulla. And then as you move across, there's a horizontal segment. That's the third portion of the duodenum. And then there's a sweep that comes through. It's the ascending portion, or the fourth portion of the duodenum, as you get to a ligament called the ligament of trites. And that's sort of the transition point between what you would say is duodenum and jejunum, or the next part of the small bowel. This section of the duodenum is about one foot in length, um, just so you can get a gauge of in that huge realm of 20 to 25 feet, this is really small part. And so what happens here is, I said, the second portion is typically where you have your papilla or your ampulla, and that's where our common bile ducts and pancreatic ducts come in. And why are those important? And well, they're important for a couple reasons. One, when we talk about really digestion, so the stomach masticates, it really mechanically gets pieces um, of your food that you eat into smaller parts, but then it has to mix with stuff in order for you to absorb the macronutrients and the micronutrients. And so what happens is enzymes are released, and this is where you see amylase and lipase, and bicarbonate is released, which neutralizes that acid in the stomach, because acid can break stuff down pretty well. And so if you release acid with a bunch of enzymes, you're going to denature or make your enzymes inactive. And so the bicarbonate is essential there so that you can neutralize the pH and allow all these great enzymes to work to assist in digestion. And then um, the nutrients then can flow down further into the small bowel. Of note, and this comes when we talk about disease states, iron is absorbed in the duodenum. So if you think about processes, if somebody comes in anemic or iron deficient, one of the things that we think about in the back of our heads is, is there a process involved in the small bowel that's preventing absorption of iron, and is it related to the duodenum? And one of those things that you'll hear me talk about later is gluten-sensitive enteropathy or celiac disease, and we'll talk about that in our next segment. And so moving along, as you pass the ligament of trites, you'll get into a large segment called the jejunum. And this is about 8 to 10 feet in length. Now, 
Unlike the duodenum, which you have that transition point between the fourth portion, ligament detrites, and then jejunum, there really isn't a defined area between where the jejunum ends and the ilium sort of begins. It sort of all flows um, together there. The thing about the jejunum that I would tell you, and we'll see in a minute, is its really main job is to do the absorption of all the micronutrients uh, and macronutrients along its path. And so along that 8 to 10 feet is where you're going to get it. And how does it do that? So it has these projections or these finger-like objects that are called villi. And what that does is it expands the surface area of the small bowel. So not only do you have 20 to 25 feet of small intestine in you, but then you have all these little finger-like projections which then expand that surface area. And so what do they look like? Well, in endoscopy, they look like coral. And it's nice if you put some water in, sometimes they sort of float back and forth and look pretty. Um, those are the villi, and those are healthy and normal. And so really, that expands the surface area to around the size of our GI endoscopy lab that's right across the way, our porcine lab. So it's a, roughly the size of about a tennis court. Um, is what we have inside of us. So as you can see, if you have that much surface area, you know that's your absorption. But not only does it have these large finger like that you can see on endoscopy, but there's also a small brush border of microvilli. And so you get even further in your um, surface area for more absorption. Moving along down to the ileum, it's the final section of the small intestine, and this is about 8 to 15 feet. So you could sort of see how what we said the duodenum was the shortest, then we have the jejunum in between and the ileum there. And it ends, we know when it ends, because it ends when you pop into the large intestine or the colon. And that's at the ileocecal valve. And so if you've observed endoscopy or you hear sort of where does this pharmaceutical product work and people say ileocecal valve, that's that transition between where the small bowel enters into the colon. Um, and its main function is to get everything that's not absorbed by the jejunum and particularly, and this is important, B12 and bile salts. And so our bile salts are what's been secreted up top further to help us emulsify our fats, and it helps to recycle the bile within our system. And vitamin B12, as we know, we, um, if we um, don't have absorption of that because of our small intestine, we're going to become deficient there. And so emptying through the ileocecal valve, going into the large intestine, also known as the colon, um, it's sort of the last part of the gastrointestinal tract before um, our excrement. It's about four to five feet in length, and its major, major function is to basically resorb water and salt. It absorbs between one and two liters of water, which is why when you think about diarrhea, you should think about is there a problem with the colon? Um, and so it may not be absorbing all that water. And so if it absorbs one to two liters of water, it generally leaves around 100 to 200 mLs of water to mix with the stool material so that you can sort of pass it easily. Um, and then it eliminates the solid waste. And so how does it do that? So moving through the points here, as we pop out, and I'm gonna try to use this pointer here if I can. So food will, or sorry, um, from the small bowel, it empties into the cecum. And then traveling north up the ascending colon, we come to this area here. And this area here is known as the hepatic flexure. So if you hear people talk about the hepatic flexure, that's where it is. And the reason why it's called hepatic flexure is because it sits right where the liver is. And then coming across, you have the transverse colon. And so if we talk about sort of redundant colons or loops, sometimes this segment can dip way down depending on its length and the person's orientation. And then coming into this segment here is the splenic flexure. So the flexures are those two areas that sort of tent up the colon is the way that you can think about it. And the reason why it's called the splenic flexure is because it sits right where the spleen is. And then we come down the descending colon. The sigmoid colon follows. And then you get into the rectum and then the anus for excrement. Now, when we also talk about segments of the colon, you might hear people talk about the right colon, the transverse colon, and the left colon. So we think about the right colon being from the cecum all the way up the ascending colon to the hepatic flexure. 
and then the left colon starting at the splenic flexure and moving all the way down to the anus and rectum. So how does the colon move? So similarly as up top, we have peristalsis, but it can contract and then relax to sort of get that water absorbed and get your sort of bolus ready um, to make feces. And so we have peristalsis moving forward and reverse peristalsis, particularly on the right side. So it can sort of really send that material back and forth while it's doing its job. And then across the transverse colon, similarly, but it's to a lesser degree or a lesser extent. And finally, as that bolus forms, it sort of moves what's called mass peristalsis. So now you have a, a sort of a, a, a load there that you can send along um, to the rectum. And the rectum holds the stool until it's an appropriate time for you to defecate under normal circumstances. And so how does this process work? So we have the rectum and the anus, and there's several muscles involved. So we have the external anal sphincter, which is on the outside. We have the internal anal sphincter, or on the inside, and the dentate line. And the reason why the dentate line here is so important is it's the demarcation zone of several different things, including nerve fibers, uh, the blood vessels that orient her, and your ability to either voluntarily control or involuntarily control. And so with that, we can see the internal sphincter and above the dentate line are typically under involuntary control. And when we do our defecation maneuvers, we're actually able to control the external anal sphincter. If we think about hemorrhoids, the reason why external hemorrhoids tend to be painful if they get thrombosed and you can feel them is because they're below the dentate line. And that's that stratified squamous uh, epithelium like Vivek was talking about that you'll see again at the very bottom end. The rest of it is columnar. And above the dentate line, which is typically where like internal hemorrhoids lie, people really can't feel or don't know that they have them unless either they protrude or we tell them after an endoscopy or anoscopy. And so how does defecation work? So essentially there's a muscle and your pelvic floor. And so the muscle that really helps to coordinate this is the puborectalis right here. And so what it does is it creates this angle. And so you can see by pinching up that angle, stool isn't just going to sort of drop out. And the pelvic floor is heightened. And so when it's an appropriate time to defecate or the active state, what happens is that muscle relaxes, which then drops it down so that this angle expands. And so it's more of a straight line on the pelvic floor, drops and descends. So it allows that storage now to be evacuated. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Okay. Yes, question. Um, so I don't know if we, is there a difference in incidence of cancer um, for, for the ascending versus descending versus transverse colon? And if so, do we have a hypothesis why? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so um, a couple different answers. The, the thought process um, sort of now is potentially right-sided lesions. Um, uh, can be more aggressive uh, when found. It's a matter of are we detecting them and um, in what fashion as well as what they look like. So sort of um, you have these large flat polyps or sessile serrated adenomas which can be evident on the right side. Um, and with that uh, essentially, they, they're thought to have a higher risk of changing into um, uh, a true sort of malignancy. Mm -hmm. um, the thought process there might be that they're exposed to a different either microbiota or um, bile salts uh, through the small bowel and that the environment on that side of the colon is different, which leads to some sort of um, behavioral changes in that capacity. Um, but that work is still underway and, and ongoing. Okay. But I think the, the, the main thing that we know is that our, um, our recommendations as far as coming to get screened for mm -hmm. colon cancer uh, remain such to hopefully pick up those aggressive lesions. And right now, the way that we practice endoscopy is, you know, you see a lesion, you, t you take it off. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might have heard sort of this um, find and discard mm -hmm. uh, being talked about. 
really the, the ways that that work is if we change the dynamic and say, well, our main mission isn't to find and remove everything. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not currently um, sort of standard of care. Okay, thank you. Yeah.